Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today and welcome. My name is Ann Dodge. Uh, I am the executive director at the Mansueto Institute for Urban Innovation at the University of Chicago, and I am your moderator for today's session. Uh, I just want to say on behalf of all the panelists here, we're very pleased that you're able to join us here at the 2020 UN World Data Forum, and we're grateful that you've made time wherever you are in the world or whenever you are to join us in this session. Today's session is called the Million Neighborhoods Map and Open Reblock Spatial Data Driven Processes and Tools to Accelerate Sustainable and Equitable Human Development in Fast Growing Cities. So briefly, um, uh, a little bit about the Million Neighborhoods Map. This is a um, interactive data visualization that identifies the global scale of slums and critically underserviced neighborhoods across Africa, Latin America, and parts of Asia. This is a, a collaboration between the Mansueto Institute and um, a bunch of our partners. Um, uh, it's also the product of research that was originated by our director, Luis Betancourt, who is a professor of ecology and evolution here at the University of Chicago. So the map itself is a first step toward bringing vital infrastructure and improved access and services to people living in slums and informal settlements across the global south. And, and it's really just a first step, which we we understand it to be, and we're hoping very much that people on this session um, will take a look at it, take an interest, and give us your feedback on how you think it might work better as a tool for actual change in communities. So uh, with that said, you can check out this map at millionneighborhoods.org, and I would like to welcome our speakers today, but first a few quick housekeeping remarks. So we'll have four speakers today because Alex will not be able to join us. Um, each of our four speakers will talk for five to seven minutes. The event should end completely at 1015 Chicago time or about an hour and 10 minutes from now. As the speakers are speaking, please feel free to ask your questions through the Q&A area of Attendify, which you use to register for this event. Uh, we'll not be answering the questions during presentations, but we're going to be collecting them throughout the talks, and then we'll put them to the speakers at the end of the event when everyone has had a chance to give their presentation. So that said, please feel free to share your questions throughout the presentation on the Attendify platform. And now I would love to welcome our speakers. The first speaker is Jemiatu Sase from the Federation of the Urban and Rural Poor in Sierra Leone. Second speaker is Joru Rubain from Stellenbosch Municipality. And then we'll be joined by Royal Mabakang from Nib Namibia University of Science and Technology. And Royal has also agreed to share a little bit of what she understood um, Alex Mutabeti would have been speaking about. He comes from the Namibia Statistics Agency and they've collaborated for a long time. So she will be able to present a bit about that partnership. And our last speaker is Louis Downing from Global Infrastructure Basel. And those are our distinguished speakers today. I'm going to go ahead and hand it off to Jamiatu. And thank you all for joining us. Thank you. Good morning and good afternoon to us here. Uh, my name is Jamia Tisise, a member from Federation of Urban and Rural Poor, which is fed up and a resident at Duaza community. I'm here this morning to talk on a team which is generating and leveraging data and statistics to ensure visibilities and voice for everyone, a participating approach to data collection. But I would like to give you a brief back, background about us, which is Kurosaka and also Pedro. Center of Dialogue on Human Poverty and Alleviation is a non profitable and non governmental organization established in 2011. We are working to mobilize and provide both technical and financial support to its community counterparts. Federation of Urban and Rural Poor, which is fed up. Fed up comprises of vulnerable women, men, youth and children 
who are mobilized around dynamic savings screen, network assessment, cities and national level to drive a collective bottom-up initiative, influencing change towards inclusive and resilient cities and localities and contribute to national development agenda. I'd like also to briefly show you our trust program area, which are as follows. One, we have our livelihood. Second, we have our community planning and upgrading and social service delivery. Third, we have our urban health. Fourth, we have partnership, building and networking. And the last one is the advocacy. My, my um, thema thematic area for today is generating and leveraging data statistics to ensure visible and voice for everyone, a participatory approach to data collection. Um, our way of collecting data is a data life cycle, which we are using our top bottom approach. We start with the community data collectors. And you can see in the circle, you can see Federation and also Kurosapa, they are the center of it all. And we start with the community data collectors, which I'm part of, and I'm a resident at Waza community. We are responsible to collect the data and make sure that we, we are able to analyze the data and they are responsible to collecting, analyzing the data the data now move to the community stakeholder, which is they are responsible to develop advocacies and action plan. After validating and also developing advocacy action plan, based on the action that we have developed, we will engage our city and central government based on our advocacy, if successful, an action or development program or projects are being used to implement back into the community. As you can see, we have our community data. They are responsible to collect and analyze the data. We have our community stakeholders and the city authorities, government, other agency, and our outcome, which is the action project, give the feedback to the community data collector. Our way of collecting data, we have a two-side approach, which are, we have the settlement level data, and also the household level data. For the settlement level data, we support community advocacy drive, which we design community development action plan. By doing this, we state out our challenges, knowing our lines right, stating out our priority, identifying other points, and also bring up community initiative. For our household level data, we have our community planning, which we have our population, a livelihood, health, and also access to services. I can give you a typical example in these communities, which are the Moab community. Now they are more boasting of knowing their community better. How? By the data that we have been collecting from them, which is the household level data. They, are no, they have been knowing how and the population size in their community, what their livelihood, and also the, about their health and also the access to their services in these communities. And we are using our GIS technique data format. We have the two side approach also. We have our settlement level data and also the household level data, which, have, which I, I have stated earlier on. By so doing, we have our GIS shape file, we have our CSG of services, and also the citywide report and poster. The reason why we, we did the reporting and poster, because most of these community people that we are working with. Some of them are not educated. So we use those posters and also the reports for them not to left behind, for them to, 
to feel part and belonging to the community. So we use report and posters for them also to understand what are the dynamics and what are the things that we are using in this community to give them their updates or feedback in their communities. These are some of the outcomes and examples of the data that we have been collected, collecting in this community. We have the constructions of feeder roads at Kamayama by the CDNC. These are the examples of the data that we have been collecting. The youth in this community come together, identify what their felt needs and what their priorities in this community. So they deem it fit that they should construct a feeder road at Kamayama community. And this is done by the CDMC for them to gain or have access of roads in their communities. Also, Hali, I have made mention on a point, and this is the hazard mapping and resilient action plan. We have been out of hazard points in these community. So the community residents and community people have identified these hazard and mapping points so that we can re and resilient action plan for us to see the betterment and improvement in these our communities. This is the constructions of drainage by residents in the Waza community, which I'm part of. And we can get it back. The flooding that occurs is due to the poor drainage system in our community. So, so the, the data that we have been collecting that shows, that indicate that this bridge needs to be fixed up by community people. And this is the, the usefulness and use of this data that we have been collecting in this community. Now you can see the constructions of drainages by residents in the Waza community. To mitigate the flooding in our community, so we deem it fit to construct a drainage by us in the community. And you can see this is the planning initiative by community people. And we can from our settlement, we can see we can we are going to deforest the community, which causes flooding and also a lot of landslide in this hilltop community. So the community people brought up an initiative, which is planting initiative by host the community people. And as a result of the data that we have been collecting and we have identified that this is necessary for us to reforestate again the community, for us to mitigate the flooding, the angry boulders, and those other things that are happening in our community. Thank you all. My name is Janati Sisse, representing Kurosaka and Perot. Thank you so much, Jamiatu. And now I would like to welcome Joru Robain from Stellenbosch Municipality in South Africa. My apologies, everybody. <laughs> okay. All right, let's go there. Let's go there. Okay. I'm just experiencing one or two technical problems. I'll sort them out quickly. Um, there we go. Right, good afternoon, everybody. Joru Rubain, Stellenbosch Municipality. And I will be presenting on the search for order in informal settlements by using spatially driven data and technological uh, um, advancements. Now, um, let's start off with a very uh, scientific um, phrase um, of entropy, which is that there is order within this order. The reason for this is that we are talking about informal settlements and um, it, informal settlements are always seen as Areas where there's lots of negativity, nothing um, that seems to be orderly. Yet, when a person scratches under the surface, you find that there's actually an order and a structure that is being upheld and, uh, and, and kept in place by the community itself. So, 
our department has for over the last number of years looked at various ways of accessing and enhancing that order um, through various means and um, basically using the community as a feeder to um, assist in um, um, basically arriving at an order. If you look at the pictures on your right hand side, you will see that um, with a, oh, sorry, you can't see the mouse. But basically, that is a story of how we build the road and, and also how we, with the community interaction, um, has done some re-blocking actions over, over the years. So what we have here is that we're looking at some sort of uh, um, a theoretical framework. Basically, it is premised on the Gestalt principles. And the most important one that we are looking at is, um, for this particular instance, is that there is symmetry and there's order, and we're always chasing that symmetry and order. The one problem that we're sitting with, unfortunately, is that we have been collecting data now for quite a number of years, and we have a, quite a disparate source of data, which means that that data doesn't always speak to each other. What we are trying to do is then our, our desired outcome is that we, we would like to have an integrated set of data that speaks to all our informal settlements um, um, on various levels. So. What are we trying to, to do in, in order to, to create that um, order is that we're trying to foster partnerships. And I think the previous speaker also alluded to that, that we are trying to fo foster different partnerships in order to arrive at a point where we can have this data that's available and accessible to all um, um, our constituents and anybody else that's interested in it. So just to speak on the um, disparate um, data sources is that we started off with community generated um, surveys and those surveys were mostly run by um, NGOs, but the municipality or our municipality then saw there's an opportunity to integrate that data into our bigger scheme of things. And um, if we if you look beyond the anecdotes of, of, the, of the particular informal settlements, you will find that there is actually some useful and usable data that we can use um, moving forward. The second um, issue that we that we encountered is that there was a lack of communication, notwithstanding that we have all this data. The various um, providers of the data, or the sources of the data, didn't necessarily speak to each other, and um, there was a lack of um, integration. So our approach was that let's look at the interconnectedness of things. Now you can see, um, I'm not sure if this uh, screen is so so um, clear, but basically. It speaks to all the sources of data and how they speak to each other. And you can see it become, becomes quite a potpourri of various um, sources of information, which we wanted to collect and integrate. Once we started doing that, we also saw, if you see the two red lines, that there was different, um, there were still areas where we haven't covered um, looking at the, the, the various sources of data and integrating that into our system. So we started off, as I said, from hand-drawn pictures, looking at um, how the figure ground the, uh, um, aspects of things and just see how they speak to each other. We then started using um, internet-based and free, um, I must add, internet-based and free, um, 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 uh, shall I say, service providers that could uh, basically take our data and integrate same to us. Um, then we've obviously used also um, other um, uh, um, sources um, um, to, to, to take our data and basically portray it on the world scale. Um, again, we're looking for free options and we've, uh, we've basically managed to um, through within the Million Neighborhoods uh, Network or, or map, um, started to map most of our um, informal settlements. Added to that, we also then started um, looking at other sources of, as I said, software, where we can start looking at um, how do we portray this data. Now, I, I just want to pause at this particular map. It's not the best in the world, but what we are doing here is basically we are creating a four-dimensional, if you want, for lack of a better phrase, four-dimensional um, uh, um, effect of data in an informal settlement. So if you look at the, the one structure, with the red number on it, what we have now is we have. Oh, a I'm just going to jump in quickly. I don't think we can see your map, and I'm I'm not sure the screen. I don't know that we can actually are seeing your screen right now. You're not seeing this one, this particular one, or everything at all. I don't think we're seeing any of them, but it seemed like it. it uh, 
Uh, we are hearing you loud and clear and we can see you, but I don't think we can actually see your graphics. Okay, but you, could you see the presentation? No, we're, we're actually not seeing it, but we, I, I, we were hoping to be able to communicate you. So do you see the share screen button on the bottom of the Zoom, the green one? Didn't I share my screen? I oh. don't think we're seeing it, no. Oh, because my screen share is on, it's supposed to be on. So the, let's, let's try again. Ah, got it. Got it. You see the screen now, you see me. Yep, no, we see the screen, looks good. Okay, okay, right at which slide am I now? Well, you the were talking about a map, where, which was exciting, which is why I jumped in. <laughs> okay, right, um, where am I now? Now I'm, geez, now I have to find myself quickly. Right, find yourself. Oh, I'm not <laughs> okay. oh. Come now, there we go. Do you see it? You still with me? Yes, we see it. It looks great. We see the image. We see the the okay. chat and the Bro, Okay, just let me just then rephrase about that image. What what I said is that we have um, four uh, dimensional. Um, uh, uh, geez, let me just catch my breath. <gasps> Got it. <laughs> We're looking at a four dimensional picture of basically an informal structure where the community basically provides the um, information of the person that resides in the structure. We then that inclu includes that information in our database. We take two dimensional pictures of the structure and then we also add geolocation so that we know where that structure is. Now, the reason why we're doing this is just as a, by way of an example, is that when, when the community needs to um, go to the bank uh, for a loan or clothing uh, that they wanna buy on, on credit, they need a, an address. So what we are trying to do with this process is uh, just one of the things that we're trying to do is to create a, um, a uh, what's the thing's name now? Basically um, some sort of uh, data that is acceptable to all our lending institutions. You see? Um, if you want to look at this map further, you can see it on this um, uh, the website at the bottom. So why the million neighborhoods map? Right, it improves service delivery. It is cost effective and, and obviously again, it improves service delivery. <laughs> well, we can monitor the settlement growth because it seems in the recent times, um, land invasion has become quite a popular um, topic in, in South Africa. Our department specifically has insufficient human resources, so that's why we're using all these other uh, data sources to assist us um, basically in creating a larger audience. And then obviously, if we use the open source platforms, our um, information is available to anybody that needs that kind of information. It, it broadens our pool of knowledge and uh, contributors, and obviously it supports our argument for service delivery and most importantly, um, funding. Other possibilities that we have with in, in doing in creating this process is that it creates um, a, and attracts community-based um, tourism, increase local economic development, and uh, job creation obviously is a very high um, importance. And then there's a better understanding of informal settlements in general, which is the primary purpose of our department um, for doing this. Then lastly, um, I would want to say that. Uh, we want to take it from the unimaginable to the audacious because um, what we're trying to do is not necessarily seen in the bureaucracy as um, proper or the way we should do things. And I thank you very much. Thank you so much, Joru. That was that was great. Uh, I think we could all use some more audacious thinking these days that, that was that was really lovely um i'll let the rest of the speakers know too if this time if we are not seeing your slides i'm going to jump in earlier and just let you know so sure. don't worry i will i will tell you if we can't see them um our next speaker thank you joe Rue, is royal maba king from namibia university of science and technology welcome royal All right, uh, good afternoon, everybody, or good morning, wherever you find yourself. My presentation is going to be on community data for sustainable development with a focus on the role of universities. So first things first, um, just for me to guide myself in the presentation, 
I would just want to give a brief introduction over on the Alliance for Informal System and Upgrading. And then I'll speak a bit more on participatory data and the role of universities and um, also go into stakeholder engagement. And then lastly, the link that um, we have with the Million Neighborhoods Map, which focuses on informal settlement upgrading and reblocking. Uh, the Namibia University of Science and Technology formed an alliance with civil society organizations and also members of community-based organizations such as the Shack Dwellers Federation and the Namibian Housing Action Group to promote and support informal settlement um, upgrading. So our entry point as a university and specifically as a department is to support communities in their efforts to collect data and negotiate uh, with local authorities. So what we have is the entry point for the university was to first have a memorandum of understanding with the NGO, which is Namibia Housing Action Group, an affiliate of the Slum Dwellers International, and also the planning departments that could encourage and promote students' engagement. So what, what this also led to is that students and communities formed partnerships, where if there are specific activities taking place in informal settlements around data collection, you had students um, through the different uh, courses also engage with community members. So whatever the students were doing was, was, was going to or did contribute to their, their, their final grades for the courses. And then there's also an arrangement that is currently being made for students to partake in community data collection through um, summer schools. So most of the data collection processes that we support as a university are community led. We have uh, students and also faculty that are part of the department of um, uh, land and property sciences and also architecture and planning, supporting the communities through the verification of the data. So once in every activity that we engage in with the community, uh, we had support from the National Planning Commission where they provided the aerial images uh, in order to verify um, the existing structures that are in the informal settlements, um, availability of services, or any of the other items that were deemed necessary for any planning um, um, intervention that was agreed upon. So what we also did is that, oh, there's a typo there. The data collection was centered on the needs. So it's either when the communities and the NGO decide to do a data collection process, there had to be an agreement whether it would be an enumeration or a profiling. Because enumeration, as we saw, were a very, um, time consuming, uh, at least from our end, and requires more resources than profiling. So in the instance when you have a settlement identified for upgrading, the focus would be more on, um, on enumerations. And some of that detail has been explained by the, by the first presenter who provided a very beautiful outline in terms of what type of data they get to collect. So when we get to stakeholder engagement, what we have is that in order for the university and also the NGO to engage with the communities, local authority agreements are very important. So the university, as, as I already mentioned, has these partnerships through the town and regional planning and land administration departments where they can engage with um, informal settlement communities. But then this partnership is um, spearheaded by the NGO and the community-based organizations, which is um, the Shack Dwellers Federation. We have national government support and engagement. Uh, there is also an ongoing M memorandum of understanding with the Ministry of Urban and Rural Development. So all these agreements are important in order for students to engage and also the universities to avail uh, staff uh, members to, to visit or be work, work, to work in this different informal settlements. What we also noted uh, through our prior, uh, previous um, community engagement is that development partners are very important in our efforts to support data collection. Because as much as you don't necessarily, it's not really capital intensive or you don't need a lot of funds, there's also an aspect where we have to, we have to travel with students from, from um, Ventuk, which is the capital city to other parts of the country. And that is always uh, supported in one way or another by our development partners. There is an ongoing um, discussion around the recognition of community data, especially by the Ministry of Urban and Rural Development. Um, I will share later on as well uh, in terms of what partnerships have been formed with the National Statistics Agency. What we have seen uh, with, with the data collection and, and the efforts of students and communities is that the data is essential in, in supporting negotiation. 
And then this data has been used to in informing community development priorities. So whatever has to be planned or upgraded has to be informed by data that has been collected by the community and is based on community needs. So what we have seen in some of our projects is that one of the main um, development priorities for communities is tenure security, where community members through um, the data that we have collected have shown and it has been clear that they are in need of tenure security. So most of the, the feedback that we get uh, from the discussion is that there is a need for land. There's a need for housing as well and water and toilets. But then all these has to be um, organized in such a way that we could understand as a university and also with negotiations with the local authorities, what are the most important priorities uh, for, for the different communities. So what has been one of our biggest, um, I think, success stories for Namibia and especially for, for the university was the informal settlement upgrading or reblocking process that took place in Freedom Square. So what we had initially in in 2012, we had data, we had a data collection that took place in all four informal settlements that you find in one of um, the regional capitals in the northwest part of the on the northeast part of the country. So communities collected data on each and every individual household. They mapped all the structures and household priorities were identified. So you had students from the town and regional planning department come in and discuss how they can go about designing and planning for the settlement. Communities uh, went in and as well with the guidance of the students and, and some professionals into designing their own layouts. So what we had at the end of the day is we had this formalized layout that could I, um, identify the different areas within the community where people could shift uh, with a minimal um, disturbance. So I think for, for us as, 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 as in Namibia in general, it was a success story because normally what you had with, with relocations or informal settlement upgrading is that people had to be relocated. Um, and then this normally always used to disturb some of the social links that they had established. So what we did with the reblocking uh, project is that communities had to be actively participating in identifying where they are going to move and how their structures will be um, will have to be uh, shifted in the settlement uh, in order to avoid the most um, minimal disruption. And what we, we ended up having is that we had about 1,000 uh, households each getting 100, 300 square meters uh, um, parcel that they could call their own. And it's still an ongoing project. I, I know a few weeks ago there was a report that some of the households um, that have been relocated have finally managed to build permanent housing. So what we see as an alliance um, supporting um, the civil society organizations is to push this side of sort of um, project approach to cover the entire country. So where are we currently in terms of the data specifics component? So what we, what we are working on specifically from um, the Department of Land and Property Sciences is to encourage student engagement on, on data using OpenStreetMap, where specific settlements that have been identified for upgrading could be digitized, where we could digitize um, the structures uh, remotely, and then field verification can be carried out by students and communities when there is a need. So there's, um, there's also an introduction right now, and I think for Namibia, it's, it's a great step, especially for the Sheikh Dallas Federation, the incorporation of field data collection using open source data source platforms, and then also the focus on training community representatives. What we are trying and pushing for as a focus is not to try to shift or, or remove the focus on communities being actively engaged in their data collection. Because what sometimes happens, or at least what the fear is, is that the moment you digitize a data collection process, it gets to sort of push communities away or out of the discussion because um, literacy levels are not that high in most of the settlements. So we are trying to find a way, how do we link the digital data collection that is currently being introduced as a new approach with the community discussion on upgrading that have been part of the um, Czech Dwellers Federation rituals for the past 20 to 25 years. So that's what um, our focus uh, is at, at the moment. Moving forward, in regard to the power of data, in, in, 20, in 2014, we had uh, 15, there was a memorandum of understanding that was signed with the Namibia Statistics Agency, 
where data collection from communities could be incorporated in the national spatial data infrastructure. Um, but this is still an ongoing, um, what do I say? It's not a discussion. There was a memorandum of understanding that was signed, but there has been a little um, progress in terms of how we can go about integrating the data. But what we have seen as well is that the data collection process and the engagement of community members and identifying priorities with support from universities has been instrumental in leading um, the upgrading of informal settlements. Because, because it, it managed to create this understanding that communities do have resources and understanding in terms of what they need for themselves and what they could contribute. So for us, that was one of the main success factors. Um, as it was said, Mr. Alex Mutabeti might be online or not, but one of the at least biggest achievements, uh, at least from my point of view, with regard to the Namibian Statistics Agency is one, the memorandum of understanding that they signed with the Namibia Housing Action Group and Sheikh Dallas Federation to see how they could incorporate community-based data within the national spatial data infrastructure. And one of the other things that they do also have is that most of the data that the Namibian Statistics Agency gets to produce from is it the locations of um, a, a schools or administrative centers or administrative boundaries are digitally available on digital Namibian platform. And most of the, the activities that the NSA gets to do is always driven through the Namibian Statistics, Statistics Act. So that's why for us as a university and also previously uh, uh, also from the, the, the point of the, that the Sheikh Dwellers Federation is to see how do you take processes that are driven through a community approach that is not necessarily formalized, how do you get to link that to a formal process through government structures, how do you get to match those two together. So currently NSA is working on uh, the census that was supposed to did start taking place in September. Um, where we could update some of the national statistics. So in a nutshell, what we have seen as a university is this importance of getting students to understand that using data for communities is important for planning. Because the conventional approach has always been where you have a top-down structure to data collection. And normally informal settlements um, data has not always been available. So what we are trying to do is bring both the communities, the um, students that are going to be our future, the future professionals in planning, um, and then also national government together and see how we could use the skills that are available, the resources that are available in order to um, upgrade and plan uh, settlements using the community's priorities as a guide. Thank you. That's the end. Thank you so much, Royal. Um, I, that really was helpful in terms of tying in some of what we've heard from our other speakers. Um, I would like now to, um, to thank you for your time and to welcome our last speaker, uh, who is Louis Downing from Global Infrastructure Basel and is coming to us, I believe, from Switzerland. I am indeed. Um, thank you, Anne. Um, and yeah, I mean, first, first to say thanks very much for inviting me to speak. Um, and thanks also to all the other speakers um, who've just shared such amazing insights on the, on the different exciting um, things that everyone's working on. Um, so my name's Louis Downing. I'm the CEO of the Global Infrastructure Basel Foundation. Um, we're a Swiss-based nonprofit organization based in Basel. Um, and our mission is to inspire um, the world's transition to sustainable and resilient infrastructure. And we, we look at that for, through a few different lenses, um, focusing on uh, cities, resilience, disaster risk reduction, nature-based solutions, um, social justice, inclusion, um, climate change, and um, in, in improving um, finance for sustainable and resilient infrastructure. Um, because we, we recognize that um, that all of these fantastic um, sort of infrastructure projects that we would like to implement to make the world more resilient and um, to build them, that none of this is going to happen without sufficient finance in place. Um, so 
I'm going to zoom out a little bit and just look overall at the at the context of, of what we're talking about here. Um, and in fact, my my whole presentation here will be um, at a at a sort of um, flyover level, and I'm more than more than happy to answer questions afterwards as well. But I mean, the the way um, the way we see the situation at the moment is that the population is growing, and by by the end of the century, we're expected to reach 11 billion. Um, there's a few different estimates on that now, um, but regardless, the, there's certain locations in the, in the globe where the population increase is, is massive and the, and the demographic shifts are also huge. Um, and one, one other shift is that populations are moving to the cities. So this is a, this is a growing, growing issue. Um, currently, 23% of the urban population lives in informal settlement, settlements um, and secondary cities are some of the worst worst affected. So, um, so th this is also a growing issue. And, and th these are places where, in a lot of ways, people are at most risk of existing um, challenges and other emerging challenges. Uh, we're talking about you know health, safety, um, economic prosperity, um, climate vulnerability. So that the changes in in climate. Um, that, are, that are forcing things like flash flooding or extreme heat um, and other sort of other, other things that are required. So zooming in a little bit on some of these challenges, um, you know, some of the things that, that we're looking at is um, so access to basic services, um, missing infrastructure, uh, lack of connectivity, um, lack of the basic systems like an address um, which, which can also be a prerequisite for all sorts of other social, um, social benefits um, or, or social systems. Um, some social groups in particular have increased vulnerability um, and, um, and there's increasing issues related to so health and we've seen that in the past, um, obviously during this global pandemic, um, that the, the structures uh, are not in place to see that, that people are, are protected and can be protected during these uncertain times um, and um, poor, poor access to, to development opportunities. So th these are some of the you know, high level issues that we're looking at. And we really see that, that infrastructure um, can be a, a fantastic way to address some of these issues, but can also be a cause of these issues if it's not implemented in the right way. Um, and um, so what, what, what do we need to, to solve some of these challenges? Here, here are some of the, the, the key issues. What, what does the right way mean? Um, the right way means um, best practice, it's an implementation of best practice with regard to um, so, uh, social and environmental considerations of how we put infrastructure projects in. Um, community engagement being a key element of this so that um, we're not designing for people, we're designing with people. Um, and then um, as, as two sort of key enablers, there's political will. Um, and, we're, and we're talking from um, planning, you know, municipal planning to um, procurement, um, to allocation of, of municipal budgets. Um, and then and then finance um, and and finance is a particularly interesting one currently in the, in the um, sort of current COVID uh, stimulus era where a lot, a lot of the, the stimulus measures that are being put in place feature infrastructure very highly um, and we would like to work to see that those these big investments in infrastructure which are really just around the corner um, actually go to serve the most the most vulnerable. Um, okay, so this um, this finance piece is is something that's been echoing around the globe uh, quite strongly over the past twelve months. And this is a statement from Larry Fink um, in his letter to CEOs at the beginning of this year. So our, our investment conviction is that sustainability integrated portfolios can provide better risk adjusted returns to investors. So what's the message is that financiers are now more, more than ever seeking bankable, sustainable and resilient infrastructure. Um, and so um, a, a key part of this is um, also inclusion. So 
um, and, and a lot a lot of a, a lot of financiers um, are stating um, that inclusive infrastructure, sustainable in, um, infrastructure, and resilient infrastructure is now a, mass, a must have in their port, portfolios. Um, and and the reason for that is a, is a few different a few, from a few few different vectors. So. Um, I mean, what, what the quote from Larry Fick says is that, that it has better risk adjusted returns. Um, there's also low correlation to other asset classes, stable cash yield. Um, the infrastructure itself represents a long lived physical asset um, that has barriers to entry to, to other competitors and um, is to some extent protected against inflation. Um, but in addition, there's really mounting public pressure um, to see that, um, to see that the, the infrastructure investments that, that we're making now um, and that we're effectively making through money that we're borrowing from future generations is actually leading to more sustainable, more equitable um, infrastructure solutions. Um, so that's on the financial side. On the municipal the municipality side then, this, the, the COVID-19 situation has really shaken things up over the past 12 months. Um, that there's a, a huge new emphasis on health systems um, and that there's huge stimulus packages afoot. Um, so this represents a massive opportunity um, for us to invest in the kind of infrastructure um, that can be built in a participatory manner, um, can be inclusive and can deliver services that help to provide greater um, equality between people within um, urban environments. So for that to happen, there's also a few risks that need to be overcome. So um, corruption is one. Um, the, the, the infrastructure needs to be designed in such a way that the most, most vulnerable are really benefiting from it. Um, and the infrastructure needs to be built for the world of tomorrow, not the world of yesterday. And we, we know that in a lot of, in, in, in the vast majority of locations, um, regulations are still, so building regulations are still based on the last 100 or 200 years of data. And they're not, not considering how, how drastically uh, the world of tomorrow, the, with the world of the next 100 years, um, which is the lifetime of a lot of the assets that we're building, will be so very different. Um, so this is what we need. So what, what are we doing about it? Um, we, um, so, so we see that attracting financiers and guiding the public sector is really key to seeing that, um, that, that um, urban, urban systems, um, especially informal settlements and neighbourhoods in general, are having infrastructure projects built in and around them that, that really um, create positive benefits. Um, and, and we see that uh, uh, one way to, to help, one, one piece of the, of the jigsaw puzzle is the standards that can guide that. So um, the, the GRB Foundation in partnership with um, many different organizations, including um, Shack Dwellers International um, has developed the, the shore standard um, for sustainable and resilient infrastructure. And the, the purpose here is to ensure alignment with international sustainability objectives, um, to provide clarity to investors on, on ESG performance. Um, it provides a credible third party verified claim um, so that investors who claim that, they're, um, that their portfolios of infrastructure projects are uh, inclusive or are in or uh, cl climate safe or are in, um, sustainable and resilient can actually back it up with a credible um, a credible certification um, within this standard there's, there's a really large emphasis on engagement with with affected communities so you to, to be certified you can't um, just plonk come come to a municipality plonk in a massive overpass that um, in the process of, of doing, of, of being built, uh, destroys communities that would have been located in the, in the alignment. Um, so they must be engaged with, they must have positive benefits coming out of it. And this is really, really um, important in the context of informal settlements. 
um, who, who are often really negatively impacted by, by infrastructure projects that are built, whereas they need to be pos positively impacted and consider this as, um, as target, target users and beneficiaries of the infrastructure. And then finally, what, what the standard system does um, is gathers data to demonstrate the improved performance of more inclusive, more resilient and more sustainable infrastructure. And this then forms a, a self-reinforcing cycle where we can use that data to further convince financiers, their stakeholders, and also the, the public sector that these are not nice to have. This is not window dressing. This, this is something from, from the financial perspective and the strategic perspective um, is an absolute must have in infrastructure. Um, so as a quick, quick summary, um, global challenges are increasing. Um, those, those are felt most strongly in informal settlements. Um, building inclusive and sustainable infrastructure is a key part of solving some of these risks, both um, infrastructure within informal settlements and the infrastructure that affects informal settlements. Um, and the approach that we're taking um, to address this focuses around the sure standard for sustainable and resilient infrastructure um, to provide best practices to those who are actually building infrastructure um, to guide public planning, um, to mobilize capital and to generate data that um, enforces the business case and um, generates additional po political will for inclusive, sustainable and resilient infrastructure. Um, so that was my quick flyover um, presentation um, and I'll, I'll leave it there. I'm more than happy to answer any questions or if you'd like to get in, get in touch um, with me to discuss um, anything that I presented, then my contact details are, are on the screen at the moment. Um, thanks, thanks so much, Anne. Thank you, Louis, so much for that. Uh, and I would like now to bring everybody back, all of our speakers, onto the screen. So if you could all turn your turn your audio, or at least turn your video on, and be ready to turn your audio on because we're about to open up for questions. So great, Joe Roo. Um, hopefully, we'll have Royal joining us. Um, and Jamiatu, if you are there as well, great. Please come back so we can see you. And uh, a quick note for our audience. So we've noticed an interesting thing that Attendify, which is the UN WDF's platform is great for many of you, but a lot more of you have joined us just via Zoom. If you have joined via Zoom, we don't have the chat function enabled, but you can in fact raise your virtual hand. Uh, if you click on the bottom of your screen, it should, there should be a button that says participants. You can open that up and then you will see at the bottom of the participant window, a chance to quote, raise your hand. If you would like to ask a question live with your audio and maybe even your video on, uh, please feel free to do so by raising your hand and we will call on you and we'll bring you into the Zoom. Everyone else, if you're on Attendify, please go ahead and type your questions in and I will put them to the audience. I mean, to the speakers, not to the audience. Um, so thank you all so much for your presentations. This was a really wonderful way to kind of see from a bunch of different vantage points what data can do for everyone. Royal, did you want to, did you want to speak? Sorry, sorry, and I see that Mr. Alex Mutabeti is online. I'm not sure in terms of time how we're doing. Um, um, we could, I think that Alex, we do see that you're here, but I think that Alex didn't, maybe didn't want to present. I'm not sure, but Alex, if you do want to present, please at least feel free to jump into the Q&A and answer some questions. And we would love to have you. You're not under, under any obligation to present though, but if you'd like to, you know, you're welcome. Um, thanks, Royal. So I'm gonna to go to our first question, which came via Attendify. And the question is, what's, this is for everyone, I think, uh, what strategies are you using to partner with high schooler or young girls to engage in STEM programs? And I think the bigger question is, how are you thinking about creating a pipeline for the community mappers of tomorrow so that they have the technical uh, ability to do to do the work that you all described. Um, I can go first, Anne, if if that's helpful. Um, so we um, 
so we, we look at um, urban development um, and large infrastructure projects and, and um, you know, we, in implementing the standard, we, we look also at innovative ways to engage um, community in the construction of, of infrastructure. So um, during the COVID-19 crisis, it's been quite difficult for us to get out on the field and really um, engage, especially with um, children you know, that, that um, need, a, need a very specific in engagement pathway that creates a, you know, a, a safe environment for them to interact in. So we, um, we've developed now a, a um, workshop methodology using virtual reality uh, where we, uh, where we take young people through a virtual tour of a planned infrastructure project and then get them to engage and say, um, look how, you know, how is this infrastructure going to affect you? How does it need to be changed? Um, and so we, we actually ran the first one of these workshops uh, last week for a, a group of um, young female students. I think they're around 10 to 12 years old um, in Malaysia. Um, so that that's that's one way that we're engaging with um, with girls. It doesn't um, it doesn't fully answer your question about uh, about um, getting girls into STEM, um, but our, our focus is mainly about getting getting um, children and 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 um, the, the girl child uh, to to get engaged basically in infrastructure planning and and, and implementation process. In our context, we build the capacity of young people, particularly girls, and they are responsible for collecting the data. That is how I came into the data team, because I was younger at the time that they picked me up. So we involve girls in collecting data, and they are responsible to collect the data in our context. Thank you. Okay, uh, from the Namibian context, how do we involve girls or how do we create an opportunity for girls to be involved in STEM? Um, this is not directly linked to the current work that we're doing around data collection, but I know that the university annually gets to host a women in science um, camp where girls from different universities across the country are invited to the universities and are provided an opportunity to interact with different uh, professionals within, within the, the different science fields available at the university. And I know from, from the youth component, now that is directly linked to the data collection is that we do encourage young girls, especially the ones that are not going to school, to partake in the data collection uh, processes, especially around training on how to use the, the GPS devices that we have or the tablets that we use for, for collecting data uh, within within the communities, but I know now with our new program around um, using OpenStreetMap for, for for data collection, we are trying to create more awareness in terms of how um, girls within informal settlements and also across the country, not only girls but young people across the country can contribute uh, data virtually um, to the to the Namibian map. Great, so, uh, yeah. Yes, uh, I, I think what, what we're doing is basically a, col a, a collection of what the previous speakers have all said. Um, we, as a department, um, concentrate mainly on, on youth, people who have um, left school and uh, couldn't find a job, and we try to create some sort of job creation through the process of data collection and, and surveying. And we um, basically give some basic training and certification. There's other departments, however, that concentrate uh, uh, more on um, on younger girls and women in construction and so forth, and and um, those departments then deal with with that kind of stuff. But uh, as I said, our department specifically look at uh, uh, what shall I say, people that had left school and couldn't find a job or go to study or something to that effect, and those, those are the ones we are concentrating on. Great. Thank you all for um, taking that one. And I, I want to remind everyone, if you if you raised your hand within Zoom, keep your hand up because we would love to call on you and bring you in. And it, we did have a question from Crispin. If you are still interested in asking your question, Crispin, we can turn your audio on remotely and you can fire away. Um, so put your hand up is probably the best way to do this. And if you, just as a reminder, 
you, the hand raising function, if you go down to the bottom of your Zoom window, click on participants, open that window, and you can, on the bottom of that window, it says raise hand. Okay, Crispin, apparently your mic is on, so you have the floor if you'd like to speak to our panelists. Uh, no, sorry, I did not uh, have a question. Um, I raised my hand uh, unintentionally, but I'm in enjoying the uh, presentations and the discussion. So uh, that's it, thank you. Great, well, we're always happy to have um, Positive feedback, I think, is great. Um, everyone else, if you if you think of a question, please um, please know that you can ask it live. We'd love to hear from you. So we had another question that came in through Attendify. I think this was for Louis specifically. The question is, uh, what? Let's see. Do you have a link to the guidance and policies you promote on standardization? Sorry, I was just muted. Um, yeah, I, I don't think I can post anything, um, but they're located at um, uh, shorestandard.org. Sure um, uh, we, we also have um, some guidance material that's located at um, gib-foundation.org um, um, under the references tab. And all, all of our information, all of, all of our documents and, and the standard, um, everything is online for free. Um, so it's, it's all open source. Great. Thank you, Louis. Um, we had another question, which I think Royal may, may have answered via the platforms we have open. Um, but this question I'll put to the rest of the panel. Have you considered engaging with local communities in mapping exercises via OpenStreetMap? And maybe maybe a bigger question is just how are you using OpenStreetMap, the tool, um, in your work? Well, I can jump in while while people are thinking about this. We at the um, at the Mansueto Institute, where we created this million neighborhoods map, which you can see at millionneighborhoods.org. We um, definitely use OpenStreetMap data. That's actually some of what is the data underneath the map that you see when you go to the website. It's the um, it's it's one data set that we use to sort of build out this global map of informal settlements. Um, specifically, you know, the where people are outlining the settlement structures. That's actually what the data that we uploaded to create the map. So we're using it actively, but we are not community mappers. We are very much the opposite. We're in Chicago working on computers from a distance. Um, but if anybody has any thoughts, oh, Royal looks like her mic is on, great. Okay, um, okay, I, I answered a bit of it, uh, but then for Namibia, um, the use of OpenStreetMap for mapping informal settlements is quite new. What, what the Shaikh Dollars Federations have previously done was um, collect all the data and keep it on a separate platform, but then, but this data was not open and available to the public. So what we have started doing now, we did a small trial earlier before lockdown in March, before the pandemic and everything started, where we got students together from also the communities um, where uh, they have been identified to upgrade and also some students that are interested in contributing to just meet and then also map uh, four or five informal settlements across the country. And that process was well received, but it's not something that is um, sort of uh, popular yet in, in, in Namibia. And, and I, I want to throw this to, to Mr. Alex Mutabeti, just maybe if you could provide a bit more around how the NSA also gets to integrate OpenStreetMap uh, within the, the NSDI. Mr. Mutabeti. All right. Um, uh, okay. Okay. Using the OpenStreetMap to become... He had his mic on, uh, yes. Yes, uh, can you hear me? 
Yes. Okay. Uh, we in, in Namibia, I think the the, the main issue uh, really with uh, community data is the formalization of that of that data, and and those are uh, uh, issues relating to who is responsible uh, for uh, collecting this particular information and how information is is being collected uh, for a statistical reporting. And uh, what we are now doing uh, is to decentralize the collection uh, uh, through uh, uh, channels like the Shark Dwellers Federation, where uh, people who are collecting the information uh, are vetted through the national statistical system uh, so that we can have confidence when we are reporting that information. So um, I think the, the main issue is the formalization of the process of uh, uh, collecting uh, statistical information from uh, uh, communities like informal settlements uh, to get confidence at national level. Uh, that's maybe the, the issue I can raise now. Uh, how confident uh, can a country be uh, in reporting community, unverified community data. And that's the reason why we are now formalizing those, um, uh, those possibility for data sources. Because we see that there are rich possibilities uh, that can really enhance the national statistical system, but then they need to be uh, capacitated and, 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 and uh, processes being monitored in terms of how they collect the information. Thank you. Thank you. And I know that Jamiato, you were about to speak. If there's anything you'd like to add, please, please feel free. And you need to unmute yourself, Jamiatu. We are using the open street map to determine the numbers of structures. And quite recently, we have started sharing our data on the OpenStreetMap. That's my contribution. Great, thank you. Um, I'll I'll go to another question which has come in. Um, this is a question for everybody. How have you found the Million Neighborhoods Map useful in terms of the degree of access to street networks that provided? Um, and how was it useful to you and how did it shape your approach if it did? Can I answer quickly? Um, I, I think um, the million neighborhoods map, I think it's extremely, it's extremely useful. You know, um, I think in my presentation, I've showed that we've, we've basically progressed from hand uh, drawn um, maps to um, where we are, where you can have instant um, information. Obviously, if you have the uh, um, correct data available, then you can have instant information. And that's what the Million um, Neighborhoods Map um, um, supply, surprise, um, supplies, sorry, um, in, in a sense that, um, as, I, as I also alluded to, that we are, we are quite interested in, in service delivery, basically providing infrastructure to informal settlements. What the Million Neighborhoods Map does is that it simplifies the manner in which we can um, basically generate um, plans that are most probably provided the information provided by the community. Because when you work in the community, you find that the, your, your general engineering plans, they don't necessarily speak to why the community has a certain, um, uh, what shall I say, way of how we or, or how they want the infrastructure located. And what the Million Neighborhoods Map does, because it's um, basically digital and um, easily accessible, it allows you the flexibility to make changes that um, would, under normal circumstances, would have taken weeks or months, basically, to um, to implement. And um, so, yeah, that's uh, that's the advantage for us. Um, so from from the Namibian side, I would speak about the potential that it can have for us, because. Um, we have not yet engaged or worked with the new million neighborhoods map directly in order to plan. But what I see what it can do is, as Joe also mentioned, is just lessen the time it takes for us to plan 
not only as professionals, but also with communities where you can create those hypothetical access networks and then also find ways to, to merge some of the, if it's engineering designs or if it's a way to relocate some structures, that can be done much faster when you use the media neighborhoods. Now. Yes, we have been very useful, particularly the current city mayor has an agenda to transform the city. And one key tool we have been using for engaging is the million neighborhood map. So it is very useful. This is great to hear, actually, just on a personal level. I'm really glad to hear that it, it has some that has use for you because, um, you know, um, I, I also was asked to clarify that it is made entirely or it is uh, constituted from um, OpenStreetMap data. At, at present, that really is the data source behind that map. So that's worth understanding for our audience as well. Um, so I actually, we only have three minutes left. If there are any burning questions, please, or if the panelists would like to make um, a quick closing statement, this is, this is your moment. And um, thank you all so much for your participation to date. If, um, would anyone like to add anything before we close? I think just, just from my side to thank, thank you very much for organizing the event and for drawing additional attention to this really, really important topic um, and, and all of these um, really fascinating and, and impactful um, programs that are being implemented to, to make a difference. Thanks, Anne. Uh, I want to say a big thank you to you guys for creating this platform for us to share our experience of being Okay, I, I just want to echo what the other um, speakers have said. Uh, thank you very much for, for the opportunity. But well, also I mean, more importantly, I'm, different countries and different communities. Also more importantly, what I'm seeing is that, or what I've heard is that there's a lot of people that has the same thoughts and, and think about the same in the same direction as we are. And I think this is um, the start of a, maybe a good collaboration of just um, uh, massaging those ideas. Thank you very much. All right. Um, it was quite, uh, I enjoyed the talk and it was good to see what uh, is happening in Sierra Leone and Stella and Bosch with regards to data. Um, collection and use from communities. And it was also good to learn a bit more about what uh, Louis is doing um, with regard to, to, to some of the work um, promoting engagement and community data collection. I think for, for, for us, um, I would have, it's more of a conversation we can have offline with the NSA as well, is to see how do we strengthen that formalization process of community data into some of the national um, data infrastructure platforms that are already existing. But thank you so much to, to any. Thank you, Anne, as well, for, for having me. Um, thank you all. And uh, as some of you mentioned, a special thank you to Annie Boykes, who has been a fellow at the Mansueto Institute for two years now, and who is responsible not only for this gathering of this panel, but really for most of the work that has happened on the map and most of the sort of framing around what matters most, namely that it be expressive of community work. So a big thank you to Annie and a big farewell to Annie Boykes on to your next adventure. Thank you all panelists for coming today and especially um, our audience for participating and listening. We're so grateful and look forward to seeing you all at the next event. Goodbye. <laughs>